today. So, um, wait for my computer to come up. But super excited to be here today. Um, I really, truly believe with all my heart um, that God's just going to do some amazing things today. And I'm super excited to see what happens. Um, so I pray that you, uh, that you have a heart of expectation as well, of expectancy, and that you can believe with me that you're not going to leave the same way that you came. Yeah. So, um, with that said, we're going to pray and then we're going to dive in and see what Holy Spirit wants to do. All right. So Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for just giving us this moment. Um, God, I just pray that, um, this word that you've given me will transform lives today. Um, I pray, Lord, um, that your Holy Spirit will rest, rule, and abide in us. I pray, Lord, that um, every person under the sound of my voice, um, that they will experience you today in a different way than they have before. Um, I pray, God, that this moment will count for all eternity. Move me out of the way and you be my mouthpiece today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so y'all have to bear with me because I've been crying and I'm pretty sure that as I go through this, I'll be crying again. Um, so, um, because what I wanna talk to you today about is the presence of God. Um, and so when I think about his presence, um, as I've gotten older, I think, um, and my relationship with him, there's just moments that I just start to weep because I just think about, I think about him and just how awesome he is, not from like what he's done for me from a materialistic thing or anything like that, just who he is in general, um, how big he is, how great he is. And so oftentimes when I just sit and think about that, um, I tend to cry. Um, even with that last song, it's talking about, you know, um, if creation does this, so will I. And oftentimes, like when I'm just sitting outside and I hear the trees and I see how big they are, I look at mountains and the waters and all of that. It just, that's one of those places where I'm like, this is a God who created all of that. Um, this is a God who has every detail in mind about the world, the things that you see and all the details that he has about you and so much details that he knows the amount of hairs that are in your head. And at any moment that one of those hair piece follicles fall out, he still doesn't lose track of that, that he knows like the amount of grains in sand, like it's like that's an awesome God, right? And he is so in love with you, right? And so oftentimes when I like just think about that, sometimes it blows my mind to think of a God that would love me the way that he does, but yet is so majestic. So what I'm gonna be talking to you today about is prioritizing his presence. And I'm gonna be using Mary and Mar Martha for an illustration. So. Um, a question that I want to start with is, what are you willing to sacrifice for Jesus? You don't have to answer back. I'm just going to give you a moment to think as I talk through it. What risk are you willing to take to lay at his feet? Are you willing to be in the minority when the majority is on a certain path? So the scripture that I'm going to start off with is Luke 10, 38 and 42. And I'm going to be reading from the NLT version. I'll give you a few minutes for those of you that are going to be following along. Luke 10, 38-42. these braces, they act up sometimes. So sometimes I have to try to move my mouth and stuff around my words because of my braces. 
Okay, it says, and Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem. They came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, or another translation, he says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Martha, Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. So if you look at this passage of scripture, um, Jesus is passing through and Martha and and although I'm using Martha and Mary, this is not about, um, this is in a message to women, okay? So I just wanted to put that out there. We can all relate to it. Um, Martha is, uh, in my mind, very excited. She knows Jesus is coming and she taps into her gift of hospitality, right? She taps into the, I gotta get prepared, I gotta have dinner, I gotta do all these things, right? Because he's coming, right? I wanna be be prepared. And she was probably a woman based on scripture that was well off because it says that it was her home. So she was probably head of her home, someone that was probably influential in the community or something like that, just because normally, you know, a woman is not the head of her own home and owns her own home. So, you know, she was being prepared. She was doing what she was supposed to be doing when a guest is arriving, right? But she was very busy when Jesus came. So during this time, it, culturally speaking, you know, again, oftentimes I know you might hear the, a message with Mary and Martha and it, and it always kind of like shames Martha, right? Like Martha was doing the wrong thing, but Martha was in order culturally, like that's what she was supposed to do. Um, back then, women were being valued by being keepers of their home and being hospitable. So she was in the right. It wasn't like she was doing anything <laughs> wrong there. She had a gift to serve people. And we know the gift of hospitality, that is, that is something that's great. Like we all supposed to be hosp hospitable and welcoming and all of that. Um, so she was doing what she was supposed to do. And the thing as you continue to read she wanted jesus to acknowledge look at me i'm doing all this stuff what i'm supposed to be doing but yet mary is over there with you and she should be helping me so one thing that um was very interesting as i was reading it was like man they must have had some kind of relationship with jesus because it wasn't like she approached him in a uh, humble type of way. She was just like, hey, yo, <laughs> check her out. Like, she's supposed to be over here helping me. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and yet she's sitting over there with you, um, which was very interesting on the relationship that they had. So it was like, she's out of order. I'm not, so you need to check her, pretty much. But Jesus has an interesting uh, response to that, and he's like, Martha, you were in fuss about a lot of things. And Mary here is, you know, doing what she's supposed to do. She has found the one thing. Um, she has found the one thing is what the scripture says. But what was interesting to me when he responded that way was, Martha, you are so concerned about all the things that you need to do. And oftentimes that's how we are. We are so concerned about all the things we got to do. We're, we got this, we got, um, we got to pick up this child. We got to do this. We got to clean. We got to watch this. We got to whatever those responsibilities are. You can list those things out in your own life. Right. Um, and he's like, cast that on me, right? Cast those anxieties and those doubts and things on me. That's what's happening when you're at my feet. Right. But she wasn't thinking about that. She was more so concerned about um, what Mary was doing. And oftentimes we can relate to that because we will sit and we will fuss and we will complain and we'll be like, 
Jesus, did you see this? Or did you see this happen to this person? Or did you know this, whatever? And then we complain about him not doing what we feel like he should do because we were not in our rightful place. And our rightful place should be in his presence, but yet we're more so concerned about the things that we see around us. So oftentimes we can get lost in the busyness that we forget to focus and we forget to focus on Jesus. The word of God says um, in Matthew, like take no thought what you shall eat or what you should drink or look at the birds. Don't I provide for them? Look at the lilies in the field. Isn't it I that provide? Aren't you more than birds? Aren't you more than lilies? If you can not add one hour to your life, which is a simple task, that always blows my mind when I hear that. If you can not add one hour to your life, which is a simple task, like to him, that's like very simple. And since you can't do that, then you shouldn't be worrying. Ah, like that blows my mind. And then he, he carries on and says, but seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. And so oftentimes those are the things that distract us from his presence because we are worried about maybe you're not worried about um, eating maybe you're not worried about clothing maybe you are maybe you're worried about this bill maybe you're worried about this person maybe there's a family member that you're concerned about there's all kinds of distractions COVID you know you're worried about that like everything is going on right so there's so many things that you can be worried about but Jesus puts it in perspective and he compares it to if you can't even add one hour to your life. Man, when you think about that, it's like, well, if I can't even do that, then why am I worried about some of that, which he compares it and says it's a simple task like that to me is like a big deal. But he says to seek first the kingdom of God. So he prioritizes where you should be. He prioritizes you back to first seek me, be at my feet then I'll add all these things to you. Um, although Martha was doing what was expected, there was still a time, and, there's still, in a time, still a time and a place for everything. And at that time, she needed to be present with Jesus. So again, not to diminish the fact that we have things going on, it's more so about how are you prioritizing your time? We have to sacrifice daily and give priority to what's important. Um, sometimes we might have to sacrifice for me cleaning because I do like to clean. I'm one of those people that it's not, I don't, I don't dislike it. I actually love it. It soothes me. Like it makes me not have anxiety. <laughs> so I like to do that. Um, sometimes you might have to sacrifice scrolling on Facebook or IG or sports center or books or spending time at church. Like I grew up where there were people at church all the time, but never with their families. You can find them in church. <laughs> so there is always something that can pull your time, right? But the most important thing is that Jesus is saying, I need you to be present with me because when you are present with me, that's when I can give you direction to the dilemmas that you are facing. That's when you can be loved on in my presence. That's when you can just soak there and just be and that whatever things that are going on, I want to take those things from you, but you have to allow me to. And the only way I can do that for you is if you are in my presence, right? So the moments that we let the other things distract us from that, then we don't get it. And then oftentimes we'll, we'll wonder like, well, why is this happening to me or why is this going on? But I guess a good check would be, well, have you been in his presence? So if you haven't been in his presence, then that's probably a good place to start. Okay. All right. So let's look at, we talked about Martha. Let's look at Mary. So Mary chooses to drop everything. She's very risky in what she's doing. And she goes and she sits at Jesus's feet. So why would she be risky? Well, during that time, a woman technically shouldn't be learning. So that's number one. And then number two, she shouldn't have been learning from, like if anybody was gonna be teaching her, it should have been her father, um, but not necessarily Jesus, right? And then it was also risky because during that time they were trying to find anything and everything that they could 
as to why they should be killing Jesus, right? So it was very risky for her to do what she was doing, but she wanted to learn. And Jesus noticed that. It's not like he told her, like, I understand the culture, Mary, so you should be doing what Martha is doing. <laughs> what Martha's doing. He didn't have that response. He did the opposite and was like, Martha, technically you should be here with me. He didn't say that, but he was hinting to that. Like Mary has found the one thing that she should be doing. You should pretty much be following um, her lead. So Mary knew the importance and she valued the presence of God. She had expectations and she had an attitude of service. She chose not to do what was expected of her, which was what Martha was doing from a culture standpoint, which could totally be so much easier. It would be easier to do what culture expects of you or what society expects of you. It is easier to take the wide path. Like everybody's doing it, so why should I be different? I'm gonna do it too. That's easy. It's easy being comfortable, it is. It's easy not, you know, being challenged. It's easy with you just being familiar and just going, just doing the, doing the deal. <laughs> like that's easy. But she chose the narrow path. And with that comes some risk. With that comes sacrifice. It's not supposed to be easy because the easy road is with the water path. Um, she chose to be the minority. She chose to sacrifice things that was near and dear to her. She, you know, even when you're thinking about yourself, there might be moments where you have to give up things in this road or in this, this race, rather is what I was trying to say. People, relationships, things that might be, and I talked about it before, that may be dragging you behind, those are things that you might have to give up. So let's look at this second account of, uh, of Mary here, and we're going to look at Lazarus. Um, who was the brother of Martha and Mary. And this is John 11, 1 through 57. And we're not going to read all 57 verses, so don't worry about that. <laughs> um, I'm going to read 1 through 7. So that's John 11, 1 through 7, and it's the story about Lazarus, who was sick, lived in Bethany with his sisters. I'm reading through M uh, NLT. Mary and Martha. Um, this is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. And finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. So what was very interesting to me about this was the fact that number one, so Jesus had a very close relationship with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, so much that, that he referred to them as friends and loved them very dearly. But as a friend, if I call you and I need you right away and you don't show up, like, can you imagine what that looks like? They send word and he's like, okay, he's gonna be fine, but I'm gonna sit here for a couple more days, you know? Imagine how they're feeling like on the other end of that. But he knew what he was doing. He knew that I'm not going to go right away. Like I'm not going to hop up and go. Um, I'm going to wait because I want God's glory in all of this. So he waited for a couple more days. Um, also, the scripture talks about so that his disciples could grow in faith. And I also think that it was for Martha and Mary as well. When you move down to verses 20 to 21, this is where when Martha gets word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. So she has a different perspective this time. So this, like, unlike last time, like she was more so about, you know, getting her house ready and all of that. But then when I read it this time, it's like, hmm, now I think she really truly understands the importance of who he is and what he can do right? Um, so she goes out to meet him, but Mary stays in the house. 
And Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would have not died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. What was uh, very interesting to me, back to what I was saying was, she says, even now that I know that you are here. So keep in mind, days have passed, right? But she still recognizes who he is and the power that he brings. So in her mind, it's like, I don't care that it's been two days, three days, four days or whatever, you're here now. I know that you can still, you can do the impossible, right? And so sometimes I even look at my life, right? And you're going through something and you're thinking um, that you need it to happen right away, whatever that is. Um, so the old folks say he may not come when he want, want him, but he sure is right on time. But that proves to be true because oftentimes we're like, I need God to show up right now, but you don't know why he's not showing up at that moment. It could be for your own protection. It could be because he wants something bigger and better for you. You don't know what those things are. So the fact that that's what reminded me of that scripture when she said, even now, like you're, you're here now. So I'm going to respond to that. I am going to take advantage of you being here now because I know that you can do the impossible. So Mary stays back as the scripture says, and Jesus notices that. And so he requests for um, Mary to come out because their relationship was a little bit different. And when he arrived, when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet, second time being at his feet. That was like her posture, like at his feet. Um, and she says the same thing that Martha says, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would have not died. Um, and then when Jesus saw her, I'm at verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people welling with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept and the people were standing nearby and said, see how much he loved him. So the fact that Jesus already knew the outcome of what was going to happen, um, I thought that man, he was so in love with them and cared so much for them that he was deeply moved. There was like this intimate relationship with Mary and he wanted everyone to see God's glory. And they did because Lazarus did comes for, comes out when he says Lazarus come out. But the fact that he saw Mary hurt, that that also hurt him too. And he cried and I, and that again, oh no, don't do that. Um, relationship by being with God in his presence. So the last account of Mary at Jesus's feet is John 12, one through eight. And we're going to read that. I'm almost done. So it works out pretty well. Um, I might be fine. So John 12, one through eight. If not, I have it on my phone. Uh, and I'm going to be reading the Passion Translation. And it says, um, so this is, so think about kind of like where we are. We had the first um, part where Mary and Martha, he comes to Martha's house and Mary sits at his feet, um, again, prioritizing him and prioritizing his presence. And then there's another instance where they're together and, um, she's with him with Lazarus. And then this is the last account of Mary. Um, so six days before the Passover began, Jesus went back to Bethany, the town where he raised Lazarus from the dead. They had prepared a supper for Jesus. Martha served, so Martha's still doing her thing. She's in her gift of hospitality, like that's still important for her. Um, and Lazarus and Mary were among those at the table. Mary picked up an alabaster jar filled with nearly a litter of extremely rare and costly perfume, the purest extract of nard. And she anointed Jesus' feet then she wiped them dry with her long hair, and the fragrance of the costly oil filled the house. But Judas the locksmith, Simon's son, the betrayer, spoke up and said, What a waste! 
we could have sold this perfume for a fortune and given the money to the poor. In fact, Judas had no heart for the poor. He only said this because he was a thief and in charge of the money case. He would steal money whenever he wanted from the funds given to support Jesus's ministry. So Jesus said to Judas, leave her alone. She has saved it for the time of my burial. You'll always have the poor with, with you, but you won't always have me. So I'm looking at this from the vantage point of Mary. And Mary, again, still very much in tune with Jesus. Like, I feel like she knew something was going to go down. Um, and that this moment that she had with him, she wanted to give her all and her best. I don't know what the lifestyle looked like for Mary, how much money she had, how much she didn't have, but the fact that she gave something that was near and dear to her that was worth a year's salary that could have been used for something else, she decided to put that on his feet. She decided to say in so many words, I worship you, I adore you, and because I feel that way about you, I will give you everything that I have, no matter what it costs me, no matter if that means I go without. I want you to know how much you mean to me. And the fact that Jesus did to Lazarus what happened to him. So think about it, Jesus, I mean, Lazarus was dead for a couple of days, I don't know if it was the same time or not. Maybe Norris knows that. But, and then <laughs> comes back out. Right, he rose him from the dead. And then the same thing happens to Jesus. And I think Mary was so in tune with that, that even though she gave all of everything that she had, she still had a piece that I, I truly believe that he's going to do exactly what just happened with my brother, which I thought that was crazy. So again, we see her at his feet, so much in tune with him, so in love with him, this intimate relationship. I will give you everything that I have. Nothing else matters. Um, it reminded me, I watched this video of this guy. Um, he was about 22, three, three years old. And he had um, this thing where I guess he had a, really bad heart attack or something like that. He wasn't feeling well and um, ended up dying. But then he had an experience where he went to heaven and hell. And he's being interviewed by this pastor and they're talking about it or whatever. And the craziest thing to me out of all of that, a lot of times when people say, well, when you, when, when you die and you go to heaven, what's the, what's the first thing you want to do? And I, <laughs> I'm not making fun of people, but it's like, well, I want to see X person. I want to see this person. I want to see this person. I rarely see people say they want to see Jesus. That is like crazy to me. It's, it's like the family members, right? Nothing wrong with that. But I'm just saying like from a, a priority standpoint, you want to see Jesus. <laughs> I don't know, you know, but it's like, I want to see this and I want to have this reunion, blah, blah, blah. So this guy shares about when he went to heaven, things that he saw, but it wasn't like a lot. But the one thing that stuck out to me is that he talked about how, he was like, I know that I was in the presence of Jesus and all I wanted to do was to do whatever he told me to do. Like, I, and I felt so happy in that moment. Like if he would have just said to like, whatever, like I was in awe of him and I just wanted to do exactly what he wanted me to do. Like I wanted to serve him, I wanted to please him. I don't just, whatever I could do for him, that's what I wanted. And so that reminded me a lot of Mary and her posture and her position of, I just wanna be right here at your feet so that I can be in tune with you, so I can have this relationship with you, so that you can give me direction, so that I can learn from you. And God wants that, like Jesus wants that out, like from all of us, but oftentimes we, get so distracted that we can't, we won't do it, right? Um, and that's not what he wants. So back to my question before, what are you willing to give up or what are you willing to sacrifice for that presence? Because it is very much important. Time, the cares of this world, cultural influences, 
worrying, complaining, fussing, finances. And the reason why I said finances is because if you looked at what Mary did from that perfumes perspective, right? That was a year's worth of salary that she gave up. Um, relationships, whatever that thing is, what are you willing to sacrifice so that you can spend that time in his presence so that your life can be changed by doing so? God loves you so much and there is so much more for you by being in his presence. He's a jealous God, really, and he wants all of you. So I'm going to ask you to take a moment right now. I kind of went through that because I wanted us to have a moment where we get to be distraction free, I hope, and really think about Jesus right now and really take advantage of his presence being here right now to understand what does he want from you, to understand what direction does he want to give you. And maybe it's nothing. Maybe he just wants you to love on him. Maybe he just wants you to just sit with him and not worry about anything. Maybe he just wants to give you some peace. Maybe he just wants to like let you know that everything's going to be okay. But oftentimes we don't get those moments with him because we don't spend that time with him, right? And that's what he wants. Like, I just, I don't know when I was like thinking about this and praying over y'all today and over me and, you know, I'm always concerned about like, God, I just want to say whatever you would have me to say. But most importantly for you today, I really want you to just experience his presence. I really just want you to um, just like take a moment and just be with him, right? So that's what we're going to do. I want you to um, respond in a way that, you know, however God leads you, right? However he, however he leads you. So... Okay. Okay. Um, so that's all I, I want you to do. I'm going to give you that moment to do that. I, um, I have a specific song that I wanted to play. Um, not necessarily for you to listen to the words, but it's very intimate. Um, but I do just want you to just take some time like, to, again, no agenda, but I just know that I just feel that God just wants some time with you. And I just feel like he's going to show you things or what, whatever he wants to do, he's just going to do it.